Hello there, my name is Elizabeth, and I was one of the first people to move to Swampfield back in 1715. I'd like to tell you a bit about myself. I was born in 1693, that's more than 300 years ago, you know. I don't really remember where I was born, but shortly after my birth, my parents moved to Northampton, where my dad opened the first fuller shop in town. All that means is he shrunk and thickened woolen cloth by washing, heating, and pressing. As you can imagine, being the only shop in town, he made quite a living. And pretty soon I had lots of brothers and sisters, twelve to be exact. I was the eldest of thirteen children. Around 1713 my dad decided to relocate his business to Springfield, but I didn't really want to go, because all my friends were in Northampton. Plus I was 19 years old, and it was really time I start thinking about getting married. There were plenty of young men of interest, but only one caught my eye. His name was Jonathan Graves. He lived in Hatfield, the town right over. After a few years of courting, John proposed to me in Northampton, and we got married on June 2nd, 1715. I was 21 years old. That's when all the excitement really begins. We had a great opportunity to be part of starting a new town, and let me tell you, it was really something. We arrived here in Swampfield back in the fall of 1715. There wasn't hardly anything here, just a few simple log homes. Men were hard at work chopping down trees and building a sawmill. We had to clear the land to make room for houses and drain the swamp, considering it was called Swampfield. While the men did all the heavy lifting, us women had plenty of work to do as well. We had to get the root cellars stocked and supplies for winter and spin wool for clothing, not to mention look after the little ones. Speaking of little ones, my first child was born in 1716. His name was Jonathan after his father. My second child was born in 1717. His name was Ebenezer. The first few years in our new town was a real struggle with no church or school or stores. We made many a trip to Hatfield, Hadley, and Northampton for supplies. Eventually though, our town started to come together and log cabins were replaced with real homes. In just two years, over 40 houses were built. In June of 1717, the town voted to raise a meeting house, and in 1719, the first teacher was brought to town. Only one or two of these original homes remain to this day, one of them being the house at 168 North Main Street, which was my husband's cousin's house, Isaac. Sadly, on March 29, 1722, at only 28 years old, I passed away. I don't really remember how, but don't feel so sad for me. I was still here with my family in spirit. Um, yeah, my name is Joseph Field. I was one of the first settlers in the town. Um, and it's a, a little complicated story how I became one of the first lot owners here in town. My father uh, was also uh, Joseph Field, Captain Joseph Field uh, Sr. And my father was one of the original petitioners for what is today the town of Sunderland. Well, it, it's even more complicated than that because there was a, a petition back in 1673 to establish a town here, but that petition failed. Uh, even though the people from Hadley and Springfield they purchased the land, they'd gone to Boston. They started to set up the town when King Philip's War broke out in 1674. So they they uh, dug ditches to drain some of the swamps. Uh, things were beginning. There were some buildings here, but basically the town was abandoned at that time. So some of their descendants, and many of them had passed away 40 years later when they tried again to establish the town in 1713, uh, they, they asked that court to allow them uh, to build the town uh, once again to incorporate it. And there was a requirement to uh, get, uh, besides the 39 families here, there had to be a lot set aside for the minister, and that would then be, uh, a, a town would be considered a complete once they had done all that. And they were given four years to do it. So it was a short amount of time to do all the work. My father drew one of the lots. He drew one, a lot on the far side of the street there, lot number 12. There were 20 lots on each side. So one through 20, the 20th one being here next to the cemetery, and one through 20 on the far side of the street. My father was uh, got that particular lot, and my brother and I might have come here with him. My brother was still young. I was in my 20s. But uh, at that time, I had the good fortune, which was somebody else's misfortune, which was Philip Panton, who'd drawn number six on this side of the river, had a tree fall. Uh, he was killed, um, and my father purchased the lot, and I had just gotten married in 1716 to Mary Smith from Hatfield, and so my father gave us one of the lots, and so I was able to be one of the original settlers of the town. So we uh, set to work clearing the fields, uh, setting up homes, uh, doing all the hard work to get get this place to be prosperous. The hard part might have been hardest part might have been that we had to get a minister and not many ministers wanted to come out to the 
rough and tumble wilds of uh, Sunderland at the time. Uh, and uh, of course, we were still calling it Swampfield. Maybe that was bad marketing. But uh, uh, at, at that time, we finally got a minister to come up. He didn't stay very long, by the way, but long enough for us to get the, the Boston courts to agree to our petition. And the town was established. But they decided to rename the town Sunderland to honor the Earl of Sunderland, who was then the the uh, the, King, the King's Council Lord President. Um, so he was a pretty powerful man in England at the time. And a, I guess they considered it politic to yes. <laughs> name him as our, uh, name, name our town after him. So that's how we got our name. Instead of Swampfield, we are today Sunderland. Anyway, we got named Sunderland and, and the town was established. It wasn't an easy life, but we managed to do pretty well. Um, uh, Mary and I raised 10 children all of them survived to adulthood, and that was pretty unusual at the time. Um, my, my own family, my father's family, uh, there were 11 of us and only six of us reached adulthood. So that's just, and only my brother Jonathan was the only brother who survived. So there were just the two of us uh, who survived from that family. But let me, let me uh, explain also why I have a telescope here. Uh, I wanted to look back even further in our family and, and it turn, I'm quite proud to say that my great-great-grandfather Sir John Field was the astronomer in England who uh, pr first proposed the ideas of Copernicus in England. Now this was back in the mid-1500s and so the ideas of Copernicus were enough to get you burned at the stake in much of Europe but fortunately in the Church of England was more tolerant of these ideas. The idea that the earth went around the sun rather than the reverse, was something that not many people were willing to accept. Um, but uh, he was able to profess those ideas and actually became quite famous uh, within England and prospered there, uh, raised a large family himself. And his grandson, Zechariah, uh, was the one who, the field who left for America. He was wanted a greater religious freedom, came to the Massachusetts Bay Colonies, began in Boston, wasn't completely happy there, but found a minister he did like, moved on to, with that minister and a group of people of like mind to Connecticut, uh, settled in Hartford, and then worked their way up the river. So that's, Zechariah became uh, one of the founders of Hatfield, and, and that's where I was born in 1689. Major Caleb Hubbard, magistrate, Tavern owner, Revolutionary War veteran. Lived to the age of 96. My father to the age of 92. Hardy Stock, the Hubbard clan. April 19, 1775, the shot heard around the world. Battle of Lexington and Concord. I was notified while I was plowing in the field and went to assemble the Minutemen. We assembled the men in Sunderland, Hadley, surrounding area, at my tavern. The tavern was started by my father Israel. He was a farmer who uh, found that to be hard work and not profitable. So he applied to have a tavern to sell strong drink. The tavern still stands. You know Plum Tree Road, where it meets 116? There's a brick and yellow building, and then there's a lane to the north of it that leads to a big white house with a red barn. That's the tavern. That's the tavern. Many a late night at the tavern. Sleigh rides, the masons gathered there. We assembled the Minutemen at my tavern. And we assembled there and 4 a.m. the next morning we set off to Boston to engage the British. Where uh, there was a floating battery in the harbor. Uh, my regiment was fired upon by the battery and from cannon on Cobb Hill. And in the engagement I, I had the misfortune of seeing Colonel Garrish hiding behind hay and had to speak at his court-martial. My name is Israel Childs. I, my folks' thoughts were that we, my folks originally came from Marstville. They settled in South Deerfield, where I was born in 1824. When I was 21, which was uh, 1845, I went out west to uh, what they call the Wabash area, which is now currently uh, northwestern uh, part of Ohio. And I went by via the Erie Canal and also by train to learn some adventure. Uh, then in 1852, when the gold rush, I ended up in California and I worked in the uh, gold fields. And I was uh, the rough life as a gold miner for four years. Uh, after four years, I came back with a little tolerable sum of money. Not 
great, but anyways, I ended up buying a property in Sunderland, uh, which is uh, lot 19, which is currently actually called uh, number house 18, South Main Street, excuse me. And the property I bought extended all the way from what is now South Main Street all the way up to North Silver Lane. I bought that whole metal area. Um, I held it in position until 1870s. Um, in 1856, that was the year that I came back then. And then I, I married a, my love of my life. Her name was Elizabeth. Her father was Fran Francis Adams. And we had four children. And then 1862, during the Civil War, I enlisted in the military for what they call a nine month service band. And I was sent down to uh, uh, my regiment, the 52nd Regiment, was sent down to Louisiana to protect the port. The major campaigns I fought in was Port Hudson and also Indian Ridge, amongst several other small skirmishes down, down, down in that area. I came back here and I left all my whole life as a farmer after that. And I kept the land until the late 1870s. And I owned all the way from, like I said, from South, uh, South Main Street all the way up to North, North Silver Lane. And that's kind of my history. <laughs> Greetings to all. You are here for my lecture on American literature. First, permit me to tell you a bit about myself. I am Carrie Anna Harper. So my parents, Henry and Caroline Harper, they moved from Worcester to Sunderland in 1900. That's when I was 28 years of age. This was after my father's service in the Civil War. And at that time, I was an instructor at the Gilman School in Cambridge. I received my master's degree from Radcliffe in 1898 and earned the degree of Doctor of Philosophy from Benoit in 1910. Perhaps the first woman in Franklin County to have done so. I have never married and have dedicated my life to the education of myself and to my many students from Mount Holyoke College, where I've been an associate professor of English literature. I am a member of the New England Association of Teachers, the Harvard Teachers Association, the Modern Language Association of America, the Association of Collegiate Alumni, and the Phi Beta Kappa Society. Of my publications, I'm especially fond of a book that I co-authored with my dear friend, Eula Marie Dix, whom I became acquainted with during our years at Radcliffe. And she went on to become a famous screenwriter with Cecil B. DeMille in Hollywood. It's called The Bow's Comedy. And even though she is the only person cited on this cover, I am recognized inside. You're a true ghost writer. <laughs> Well, we both wrote together. <laughs> and, and it takes place in Sunderland and Deerfield uh, during the colonial period. Ooh. There's even, I'm not, I'm going to do a reading from my book. <clears throat> <clears throat> Indians! A war party! shouted Bliss in high elation. And still the bell banged, and the woman in the tow apron blew her conch shell. At that moment, a man ran to the corner of the house nearest the stockade and stepped jauntily into the roadway. He was a slender young man with dark hair and eyes and dark sunburned skin, and his head was uncovered. Those at the gate could see that his hair was drawn back in a queue after the fashion of a white man, but he wore the dress of an Indian, or maybe a Frenchman scouting with the Indians. His shirt, leggings, and moccasins were of soft deer skin. Now his best friends in London, even his kinfolk, would scarcely have recognized Landry Walford. Yet it was the same Landry, come at last, as he thought, to the end of a hard adventure. He carried his head high with the same slightly superior tilt of his chin, and he stepped lightly and easily within the, with the same little swagger and he carried his gun at a jaunty angle beneath his arm, much as if he were strolling out to shoot of his British acres. He was mightily pleased with himself at that moment. <laughs> he had accomplished a difficult, even dangerous feat, and now had won through to safety. So he thought. 
All behind him was more, mere matter of idle talk. So he sauntered forward confidently towards the gate of the Deerfield Stockade. In the height of Landry's self-congratulations, a bullet struck the ground at his feet, and a little jet of brown dust spurted up against his leggings, and at the same time a second bullet spun past his head, and he came to a sudden halt. Then amazement gave place to irritation, and taking full note for the first time of the men who lurked within the stockade, he raised his voice indignantly. Here you! Stop this nonsense! That's the end of my reading. <laughs> oh. If you're further interested in Landry and his invest in his That's adventures, uh -huh. I highly recommend this book. Our library now has a copy, and our original book, the original copy of our book, is in the Amherst Public Library in their Do Not Touch room. In closing, let me just inform you of my unfortunate and untimely death. I passed on December 13, 1919, at the age of 47, at my parents' home from appendicitis. Oh, I'll be hiding it I am William it. Delano. Okay, there it is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. All right. First, if you've come to pick up your mail, you're a bit late. I've sent all the letters to the dead letter file. So, I was the first postmaster of Sunderland. From 1815 to 1851, I was appointed by James Madison, President James Madison. But enough of that. You know, first, you know when you, you know how I used to deliver mail? You would come to my house, and I would lay those letters on the table, and you would pick up your mail. Could you read? Of course I could read. <laughs> I was an educated gentleman. <laughs> but uh, let me tell you a little bit about my family and my history. So we, my ancestors came over on the second pilgrim ship in 1621. And I know everybody knows the first pilgrim ship. Correct. Anybody know the second? You will today. We came over on the Fortune, and somewhere on the line, my father settled here in Sunderland, and I was actually born in 1770, right over here on South Main Street. And at the age of 14, we moved all the way down by the corner store. We moved to the Parsonage House. Rest assured, I'm not sure how we got there, Nobody in my family was a preacher. But my father tells me, and I only know a little bit of the story. Reverend, Reverend Ashley, who's right over here, there was a long dispute in the town between the, the Reverend and the town. I don't know what it was. All I know is my father helped negotiate the deal to settle whatever the dispute was. And as part of that deal, we switched houses. Oh, so oh. the Reverend moved to our house on South Main, and we moved to the old Parsonage house, which was located, like I said, right down by the, um, where the corner store is. And it's no longer there, mainly because of one, 116, but it burned down earlier. But 116 came along, and it would have been moved anyway. But I know you all know it because it is the house that's on the Sunderland Town Seal. That's the old parsonage house. I, I grew up and where I lived uh, my, my, my life. So I was a farmer here in town until I was uh, 27. 27, I got married. I married Lucretia Hubbard. And with Lucretia, we had nine children, five boys and four girls. And when, my, when she passed away, I married her sister. And we had three more kids. Yeah, we kept it all in the family. Uh, so, so, like I said, I had that's a little bit about my family. And when I was 
27 farming, just got a new family, married. I decided I needed to make a little bit more money. And I had a little bit more ambition than just farming. And so I started a hat and saddle rig business. And so our hats um, were primarily made of silk and mostly fur. And anybody know what our favorite fur to use for hats was? Even fur? Correct. Ah. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but first, in order to make hats, we had to get our tanned hides. We had two tanneries right here in town. And to do tanning and as well as to make hats, you need a lot of water. And so one of the things we were lucky enough to have was running, running water here in town. Piped through our wooden pipes from the springs, right to our, our, our industry. So I said we would, you know, the preferred, the preferred fur was beaver, and everybody liked their beaver hats. But at some point, beaver became scarce. And I'll get to that. First, I want to tell you where we sold our hats. All our hats went to New York City. I had a merchant there who would buy them. And the reason I wanted to come back to that was because when those beavers became scarce, we would use woodchuck and, and muskrats. And we would clip the hair really short, dye it black, work it really hard, Ship those babies into New York and those city slickers never knew it. So they, they got their beaver hats. We had to transport our, our products to New York City. Anybody have any idea how we did that? Down the river. What year? Down the river. Yeah, what year? Well, we, I was 28, so it was 1798 when we started our hats. And still down the river. It was down the river. Wow. And so the way we got it there, there were two types of ships that were used here on the river. This was actually known as a seaport right here in Sunderland. And they used to land right over by School Street. Mm -hmm. And we had two types of ships, a single-masted fall ship. And when there wasn't enough wind to drive those ships, they used to use to put the men on shore with ropes and they'd pull the ship up the river. Or they'd pull it. Um, and, but the other way was steamships. And that's mainly how we moved our product in New York. And the steamships would go all the way up to Greenfield and then they turn around and make their return trip back down. And one other thing about my hat industry, or we actually moved it from here to Danbury, Connecticut. Anybody have any idea why we would have done that? Danbury was the hat making capital of the world. They had over 80 factories that made hats. So we moved our company there because that's where all the skilled laborers were. We had the easier access to the labor. And so we moved out of the plant there. I operated it with my brother. But we've maintained a saddlery business back here in town. And our saddles were sold mostly to the local folks, but also to the, the western counties here in Massachusetts. And I don't know a lot about all the saddle business, but I do remember one story. Yes, it, was, it involved a very young, lovely couple that was getting married, much like y'all. And they were moving way, way, way out west, all the way to Ohio. And so I made them a leather saddle and a side saddle. That's how they trans. That's how they got themselves all the way out to Ohio. And rest assured. When you moved that far west back then, you very rarely came this, this way again. And you know, I don't ever remember seeing that. Um, but there's a couple other little things I do recall. The button ball tree, I know you all know that, right? It was still here when I was a kid, right behind my house, essentially. And uh, I think I climbed it once or twice when I was young. I don't, I'm not really sure. And with that, Good afternoon, folks. My name is Dr. C.G. Tro, but you can call me Doc. Most everyone else in town does. I come from a family of doctors. Let me tell you a bit about myself. I was born in 1847 and was attending high school at the Williston Seminary in East Hampton, taking scientific classes about the time the Civil War broke out. 
I attended Amherst College, graduating in 1870, and went on to Columbia University Department of Medicine, graduating in 1872. After graduation, I returned to Sunderland and married Geneva Shaw of Belcherton. Her father was in the grocery business, a distant cousin to the Shaws of Maine. They became quite a large grocery chain, you know. I decided to move the office to South Deerfield so that it would be easier to visit all of my patients since I was expanding the practice to include the folks in South Deerfield and Whaley. You may recall in my day, doctors actually made house calls. Speaking of house calls, it so happens that I was on my way to South Deerfield when I experienced one of the most awful nights of my life. It was about sundown, December 9th, 1876. I had been sent for, and although the wind was blowing with hurricane force, I needed to get to my patient. So I hitched up the horse and proceeded up Main Street to Bridge Street and onto the covered bridge. As I was a bit past the third span, I heard the most awful crack, and the span I was on, together with the two already passed, was taken up by the wind and carried to the upriver end of the piers and turned into the river. I found myself covered with boards and timbers with but only slight injuries. I somehow managed to release myself and found a position on a pier where I could be reached by boat. Upon hearing the bridge collapse, the toll house operator had sounded the alarm and men from the town came to my rescue. My horse and sleigh were found buried in timbers but could, also, could not be rescued until next morning. We were both lucky that the river had been very low so the bridge did not float off but lay upon the bottom. The remaining two spans of the bridge were blown off during the night. After this, the state decided that after losing seven bridges, Sunderland needed something sturdier. So the building of the eighth bridge marked the beginning of a new era. The Sunderland Bridge Company was dissolved and the new bridge, one of iron, was built by Franklin County and the towns of Deerfield, Waitley, and Sunderland. This bridge would be free to cross. You would no longer have to pay a toll. During my lifetime, there were a few things invented that were pretty darn useful. The first of these was the telephone. It seems I was the, one of the first persons in town to have one. It connected my home in Sunderland to my office in South Deerfield. In 1897, when the Sunderland Phone Company was formed, I even got the ability to call long distance. That was considered any place outside of the Sunderland switchboard. My family was always active in town. I was a member of the school board for 25 years, a trustee and treasurer of the Graves Memorial Library. I was independent in politics, and for some reason, people said that I like to wear bow ties. Thank you very much for visiting.